Hello and welcome to This Is Us. I'm Becca king -Reed. This week, we're coming to you from the old mission at San Juan Batista. And later, we'll be taking a look at some of the most interesting aspects of this mission, including a naturally occurring light show. We'll also meet a man whose ancestors forged the Anza Trail and helped to settle San Jose. And later, Luis Valdez, famed playwright and director. You probably know him best for his movie Zoot Suit and La Bamba. Find out how Cesar Chavez helped him get his start tonight on This Is Us. This is us. This is us. This is us. If you grew up in California, chances are when you were in the fourth grade, you paid a visit to one of the 21 missions in the state. Kids are still making that field trip today, and if you grow up around here, you come to Mission San Juan Batista. I know I did, and so did our guest, archeologist, Dr. Ruben Mendoza. Doctor, can you tell us how you went from fourth grade tourist to resident archeologist here at the mission? Yes, I'd be happy to. In 1965, I was given a release form to have my parents sign for permission to come to a California mission. And in the process, I traveled to Monterey and eventually came to San Juan, took some photos, and fell in love with the history of this site. Now, when you went home, you loved it so, you recreated it. Can you tell us about your model building project? Yes, I, once I returned, my parents didn't believe my stories about sea monsters and cowboys and Indians. And I took out my photos, I began reading about the history, and I recreated a town of 22 buildings made from tomato boxes and doll furnishings, basically. And I recreated a scale model town with the main avenue and everything else that went with it. And now you've grown up and you've come to study the real thing. Yes, I've become the resident archaeologist and curator here at San Juan. How much history is here? How old is the mission? Uh, this mission was founded on June 24th of 1797, and the portion of the building that we're standing in at the moment was constructed in 1812, the other half in uh, 1800. Okay, and in your 14 years here, I know I've read a lot of your discoveries and they're very interesting. I would love it if you could give us a tour of the mission. I'd be happy to. Join me. Well, this is just a great old door, and I've noticed a lot of these doors, and on the outside they're painted green. What's the significance of these doors? Well, these doors have been fabricated to symbolize the waters of the River of Life, which are cited in the Book of Revelations insofar as the Apocalypse, or the end of days. Uh, it is this image that signifies this river from which the Messiah shall emerge, and it is a symbol of that rebirth and there is a roar that issues from the river and literally bring forth and brings forth the apocalypse. Okay, now speaking of roars and beautiful roars, this is the mission of music. What does that mean? What has that meant in the past for this mission? Well, this mission was dubbed the mission of music uh, in large part through the work of uh, Frey Engelhardt, who studied the missions. And it was, uh, in looking at the histories, what we see is that Esteban Tapas, the friar that was here from 1809 to about uh, 1825 when he passed away, uh, he and Father Arroyo de la Cuesta would handcraft hymnals. They would color code them and they used the quatrain format for presenting the music. But because the Indians were being trained and many of them were neophytes in that regard, uh, they had to know how to read the music. And so therefore they are color coded and they're beautifully done. They are large too. Is that so they can be read from a distance? Yes, and they're also illuminated in the sense that there's usually uh, embellishments uh, in the text. There are colors that are utilized. They're on lambskin, and they are very large for the purposes that they can be read by a large Indian choir. Well, thanks. When we come back, Dr. Mendoza will show us his most interesting discovery. But first, we're going to take you to a most unusual family reunion. trace her ancestries back all these many generations to Spanish patriots that supported the American Revolution. Most notable... His name was Juan Batista de Anza, and you can find his image on paintings, murals, and on warm summer afternoons each year. 
when we celebrate the founding of San Francisco at the Presidio. To get some historical perspective, De Anza was a contemporary of George Washington. In 1775, with the permission of the Spanish Viceroy in Mexico City, De Anza assembled 30 families from a number of different backgrounds, including Spaniards, other Europeans, and descendants of African slaves. So there were 250 people that came up and settled in San Francisco, the northernmost frontier of colonial Spain. Traveling north out of Mexico, they made their way into Arizona and then California, averaging about 15 miles a day. They followed the path that was to become the El Camino Real, linking all the Spanish missions. Finally, after a difficult six-month journey, they came to rest at the Monterey Presidio in March 1776, six months after leaving what was called Nueva España in the New World. In June 1776, the settlers moved from Monterey to San Francisco and began constructing what would become Mission Dolores. They would eventually continue their journey and head south across the Guadalupe River and found the city of San Jose. You can still find the path that they took today on the Juan Batista de Anza National Trail. The trail uh, is 1,200 miles and another 600 miles in Mexico. And it's the telling of the um, settlement of Alta California by colonial Spain in 1776. If you spend any time in California, the names of the first 30 founding families are rather commonplace. They were part of the rancho culture, among them the Peraltas, the Moragas, Sanchez, Hernandez, Gonzalez, Gutierrez, Berriessa, and a host of others, including the Bernals. San Jose's Greg Bernal Mendoza Smested is an eighth generation Californian, and his daughter Maya is the ninth generation, and they belong to a rather rare group of folks known as Los Californianos. Every year we get together, we honor our ancestors who came with Juan Batista de Anza in the year 1776 to found uh, the Mission Dolores and the Presidio of San Francisco, really the city of San Francisco. We're celebrating the birthday. We celebrate those people and their contributions to history, and we invite the community to learn more about that period of California's history. It was a hazardous journey for the de Anza expedition, but they kept their spirits up by singing every evening and every morning before De Anza had them hit the trail. A trail that is still used by hikers today as they explore the original path the 30 families took so many years ago. Well, we're here at the uh, Alviso Marina uh, County Park. Uh, this is a spot along the Anza Trail uh, where visitors can hike into the bay, uh, a very short distance from uh, San Jose and the uh, Silicon Valley, uh, a very interesting spot that has the history from the Ohlone's who used the Thule and other materials uh, to the time of the Anza. He went through this spot in order to get to the East Bay and explore Contra Costa County uh, during the spring of 1776. One of the most amazing aspects of the De Anza expedition was how they were able to navigate throughout their journey. Close to Silicon Valley we hear about high technology but in the 18th century, uh, high technology was the uh, compass uh, as well as the quadrant. And Anza and Font made a big deal out of their high-tech way of navigating. They were able to find the uh, latitude. They were able to tell direction and time. And in a terrain like this, it's especially uh, important that they do that. They, in fact, got lost on their way back as they were at the, uh, the tip of the bay in Contra Costa County. Smested can trace his own family's journey back to his great-grandfather, Dianacio Bernal, who was a descendant of Apollinario Bernal of the De Anza expedition. Dianacio would go on to marry Henrietta Escobar y Casqueras, and the couple would live in a section of San Jose known as Spanish Town. The entire family tree can be traced back to Apollinario Bernal, the young boy that is depicted in this painting of De Anza that greets visitors at the San Jose airport. Apollinario, he was a 10-year-old boy uh, on the Anza expedition. He came with his uh, six siblings, boys and girls, uh, like many of the 30 families that came. Uh, he then enlisted after he grew into the military like his father. His father and mother lived here. 
They were the first, among the first colonists here. He himself then uh, came in uh, to it and was involved in the exploration of the Bay Area. He lived both in Monterey, in Santa Cruz, later in San Jose. History comes alive throughout the Bay Area in San Francisco and San Jose as people celebrate their past, their heritage, and ultimately, their connection to De Anza. In Greg's case, his grandmother Velma Bernal was raised in San Jose. She worked in the canneries, and she took great pride in the tradition and the heritage of her relatives that had made the journey north. Velma had a daughter named Yvonne Bernal Mendoza. The little girl in this photograph is Greg's mother, but it was his grandmother Velma that urged him to reconnect with his past and the buildings he would drive by every day as a college student at Santa Clara University. The city of San Jose hadn't fixed uh, the Peralta Adobe. Uh, I had no way of knowing that they were knocking down adobes all over San Jose. They weren't preserving the heritage. But I knew that she was passionate about it and that she was proud of her heritage. Both my mother and grandmother had to play down their Hispanic heritage. My mother, uh, she married a, an Anglo. She wanted to have a blue-eyed, a light-skinned child because of the prejudice that she had during the 50s and 60s. So over time, as I grew up, I, I realized that there was a pride in my parents that couldn't be expressed. The De Anza Trail winds its way around the Bay Area and is a constant link to our shared past. One of the highlights is at the Don Edwards San Francisco Bay Natural Wildlife Refuge, just minutes from Silicon Valley. The estuary is a spectacular home to a number of birds. Smithstead wrote the trail guide for the Juan Batista De Anza National Trail. And in doing so, he would follow the trail back to Nogales and Culiacan, Mexico, and in the process, rediscover a greater appreciation of his own family history. My ancestors made it here for a better life. The 30 families that came with Anza, that was their reasoning. They wanted a better life here in America. That's the American dream. The Anza Trail is relevant today to the struggles of people who still come to make this a better place. And even though I study the history, it's connected me to the present and the, both the ethnicity of the people who are here and the struggles. Nicolás Antonio Berreyesa. The descendants of the 30 original families place carnations each year at the Presidio in honor of their ancestors. It turns out that sometimes by remembering our past, we place greater value on our future. Welcome back. Dr. Mendoza and I are standing inside one of the largest models on record of a California mission, and it's made from real mission materials. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes, the uh, adobe clay was brought from the mission and fired in the tiled, and timbers from the original mission were actually cut to frame the entire building. Well, who, who did this work? This is a large, large, and it's very detailed. Who could make such a thing? Well, this 125th scale model was constructed under the supervision of Alvaro Cotier, an occupational therapist, with the help of approximately six to seven, uh, I guess you could say, criminally insane patients from Atascadero. And why, why were they chosen? Why would you choose those guys to build? Now, these guys were serious criminals, weren't they? Yes, uh, between the six of them, they'd murdered over a dozen people, uh, one of them his entire family. Uh, but they were chosen because, again, occupational therapy was seen as a way to rehabilitate them. And did they, were they, was there something in their personalities that made them uh, appropriate for this sort of work? Well, one of them was a paranoid schizophrenic who had a, uh, a penchant for detail. And so he was put in charge of all the sharps because he would never let one out of his sight. And the rest because of their artistic abilities. Well, they did a wonderful job. This was, must have been a great project for them. And tell us about the new discovery that you've made. The most recent discovery is the archaeology that I've been working on for the last 14 years. But the most recent was the discovery of the original Mission Chapel of 1797, built by the soldiers of the Presidio of Monterey. And we found its foundations right in this section. Now, speaking of that, you made a very interesting discovery about the situation of the new church, and I'd love to go into the church and take a look there. Can we step in there? Let's do that. Okay, we'll meet you there.
Now this beautiful church is one of the largest in the mission chain, is that right? That is correct. It is the only three aisle church in the California mission chain as well. That's really something. And it's special for more than just its size. Because of its situation, something special happens here. Can you tell us about what that is? Yes, the archeology span has pretty much demonstrated that this uh, site was built on a quadrangle, square quadrangle, and the church is approximately three degrees off kilter with that quadrangle. Uh, in fact, on midwinter solstice, uh, December 21st and 22nd, we have an illumination that occurs in which the sun enters through the window, strikes the main altar, drops at a 45 degree angle, and illuminates the tabernacle of the church. Uh, that tabernacle is literally the uh, Holy of Holies, uh, the Sanctus Sanctorum, in which the body of Christ is held. It is literally a sacrament of the sun in which you have the sun enter through the window and literally it blesses the altar with light of the type that was discussed in the Bible as the source of the divine light, the return of the Messiah from the east. All of that is built into this illumination. And the Indians, of course, were sun worshipers and for them, it was Cristo Helios, the solar Christ. Well, Dr. Mendoza has more interesting things about the mission to share with us when we come back. Right now, John Gregg profiles perhaps the most famous resident of San Juan Batista, Luis Valdez. For the last five decades, writer Luis Valdez has worked to give a voice to the voiceless. I don't think any of these places really speak of prosperity or security of any sort. None of those guys that live in the conditions that they expect Mexicans or farm workers to uh, live in. This town is way off the freeway, so you never see it. And, and people aren't, aren't wise to the fact that thousands and thousands of people are living like this, and they're farm workers. I mean, I can remember this when I was a kid. We used to do this, just settle for anything. Celebrated playwright and director Luis Valdez is best known for plays like Zoot Suit, and films such as La Bamba and as the founder of El Teatro Campesino, the Workers' Theater. However, his life was shaped and forged as the son of migrant farm workers in the 1940s of Central California. I was born in Delano, California, southern San Joaquin Valley, headed up north all the way up to Santa Rosa, and then back down again. Um, San Jose was uh, a tremendous crossroads then. Of course, it was the Garden of Eden in those days. It was uh, nothing but orchards. Uh, it was a community. It was a migrant community on wheels, on trucks, and in pickups, and in cars. Uh, in some cases, you were homeless. You lived in your cars. You lived in your vehicles, you know, waiting to pick up a labor camp or what have you. On the other hand, uh, it was uh, in an area of the world, the Santa, the Santa Clara Valley, uh, which was very pleasant, uh, actually, as, as life goes. It was quite possible to live under the trees there, which is what we did, lived in tents. Valdez's family eventually settled in San Jose, and he was such an outstanding student at James Lick High School that he earned an academic scholarship studying mathematics and physics at San Jose State College. However, theater and performance always seemed to call to him, and Valdez switched his major to English, and after graduation, he spent time with the San Francisco Mime Troupe. In 1965, Valdez returned to Delano, and with the blessing of Cesar Chavez, El Teatro Campesino was born. So I decided that what I wanted to do was to organize a theater of, by, and for farm workers. And so in the second week of the Delano Grape Strike, I went to Delano to see Caesar. And didn't get a chance to talk to him then, but I, I eventually caught up with him and pitched him this idea. And he said, um, well, it's a good idea, he says, but you know, there's no money in Delano. He said, there's no actors in Delano. Uh, certainly there's no money to do theater in Delano. There's no, there's no time, there's no theater, there's no... There's no even any time to rehearse. We're on the picket line every day, night and day. He says, you still want to do it? And I said, absolutely, Caesar. what an opportunity. And so it was really the spirit of the strike and the movement that, that um, inspired me. And um, I created El Teatro Campesino with the farm workers on the picket lines. Everybody! It was a form of expression, a form of protest, but also a form of entertainment all at once. We used to hop on top of uh, an old panel truck that the union had, later on flatbed trucks. It became a form of really organizing people and expressing really what the needs were. 
a nonviolent form of organization, and that was really important and part of that whole chain. Valdez continued to write and work with El Teatro Campesino, and 1977 proved to be a watershed year. His play Zoot Suit was a smash success at the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles, and the guy who once performed atop flatbed trucks hit the big time. We ran at almost 100% capacity for 11 months, which was just phenomenal. It made enough money for the Mark Taper Forum to purchase the Aquarius Theater. Uh, over a half a million people saw it, and uh, it still holds the record for the longest running locally produced uh, hit play in the history of uh, Los Angeles theater. Unwilling to sell the movie rights of his play for a cool half million dollars, Valdez instead wrote his own screenplay and ended up directing the film for considerably less cash. But he had his foot in the door as a director and a number of Latino film careers were launched. Que pues no what the hell's going on, is it? City's cracking down on pachucos, carnal. Don't you read the newspaper? Death Awakens, Sleepy Lagoon. So what emerged was a film that was kind of unusual and uh, I think holds up well. It, uh, it's still very popular. It won me more respect, I think, with filmmakers. It was not a commercial success, but it was nominated for a Golden Globe as Best Musical Picture of 1981 or something. And, um, and the fact is that uh, it's still there. And uh, it's a record, if nothing else, of uh, the original cast. It made Eddie Ormos a movie star. And my brother was also, Daniel, was one of the major figures in it. Uh, Lupe Ontiveros, who played the mother, also had a major, still has a major career in Hollywood. Tony Plana, who was the father in Ugly Betty, was one of the, one of the younger brothers. So the Zoot Suit cast uh, had their opening, their shot with Zoot Suit. <laughs> What followed was even more success for Valdez, and in 1987 he wrote the screenplay and directed the blockbuster film La Bamba, the tragic story of rock and roller Richie Valens, whose life was cut short in a plane crash. Twenty years later, the film still resonates with audiences, largely because of Valdez's ability as a master storyteller. I was trying to tell a story that was true to Richie's spirit. He would have been very generous. He was a very generous person very loving person, uh, who uh, encountered uh, a world that he changed uh, through his music. Um, the heartline of La Bamba, I think, is what, is what keeps it popular. The fact that it's, uh, it's a story of, of two brothers. It's a Cain and Abel story. There's nothing that's biblical. That goes way back. And when two brothers can, because of jealousy and anger or whatever, you know, uh, those roots that come out of childhood and, and manifest in different ways in adulthood, uh, in some ways, a competition for mama's love. You know, what could be more basic than that? Don't you walk out on me! <clears throat> Valdez would continue to work, and in 1987, he was honored with a George Peabody Award for Excellence in Television for Corridos, Tales of Passion and Revolution for PBS. Along the way, there would be other writing and directing jobs, including the Cisco Kids. Are you afraid to die? I'd rather live, me too. But what remained closest to his heart has always been El Teatro Campesino and their theater in San Juan Batista. Recently, Valdez has allowed local high school students to use his groundbreaking play Zoot Suit in an effort to promote the arts and theater in schools. The idea of having my play Zoot Suit being done in high school, particularly in this area, uh, was phenomenal. It was a learning experience for the students. Uh, I mean, I wasn't directly involved. These were other directors. I just gave them permission to do my play. We had some of the Teatro Campesino members go over and work with the students. And it was a transformative experience for a lot of these young people. Not all the Latinos either. I mean, it was the Anglicans involved because this was the first time that they really interacted and that they were able to really look across and see each other. Being high school, they had to have colorblind casting. So. Uh, even the Pachuco, the Eddie Olmos role, was played by a young woman, you know, in uh, April Saldana in, in Salinas High School, which was incredible. Here's this young woman uh, doing El Pachuco, and she did a hell of a job. So it's a learning experience for everybody. And in that way, uh, the work is able to serve. I've always believed the theater is a creator of community, 
and that community is a creator of theater. I'm of the belief that every community, regardless of economic status, should have access to a theater. I am the ballad, the ballad sings. And my voice is of the streets, and the cantinas, and the dance halls, and all the places where I am heard. For I am the soul of the common people that sings of tragedies and melancholy, but also happiness. Ora muchachos, adentro! Some men are timeless, and such is the case with Luis Valdez, a playwright and director who continues to tell stories and give voice to the voices. Welcome back. Um, Dr. Mendoza, can you tell us the story of this door? Yes, this door was installed here some years ago, but it was part of an ensemble that included the top knot. And uh, we didn't know where the top knot belonged. It was in the old Mission Museum for several years. And eventually, Father Ed Fitzhenry discovered that it belonged here. And so we reinstalled it as part of this ensemble. And so now you have the complete door as it was? Yes. So this goes to show you should never throw anything away. Um, what does the wording say up there? It says, Hic domus te et est et portacelli, which means this is the house of God and the gateway to heaven. Okay, well, if you're like me, you're going to want to know what's behind the gateway to heaven. What is back behind this door? Well, let me tell you. The boiler room. <laughs> well, it's not exactly what I expected. <laughs> and that's our show for tonight. Thanks very much for joining us. For Dr. Ruben Mendoza and everyone on This Is Us, I'm Becca King saying good night. This is us. KTEH Production.